Today's episode is proudly sponsored by the Rising Tide Mastermind. Each and every year, the Rising Tide Mastermind gets together in Atlanta for a live event. This is one of the most anticipated events within the Rising Tide Mastermind. Normally, we have a Zoom call each and every week, but this is where we all come together and we become better friends. We learn more about each other and we help each other with their issues. It is my favorite thing and I'm sure it is going to be your favorite thing to look forward to if you were a member of the Rising Tide Mastermind. That could be a possibility to find out if the Rising Tide Mastermind is right for you and you are right for the Rising Tide Mastermind. Go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind and you can schedule a 15-minute call with me to find out more. Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. I'm Trace Blackmore, the host of the Scaling Up H2O podcast. And Nation, it is time for us to get ready for Legionella Awareness Month. For the past three, four years, we have been doing this, and it's been a wild success where each and every August, we talk about Legionella. And we're not celebrating Legionella, but we're trying to get more information out about Legionella. So in just two short weeks, we are going to be smack dab in the middle of Legionella Awareness Month. This is one of our highest listener participated months. So this is why we do it each and every year. And we are going to kick off this Legionella Awareness Month with top questions that I hear when I talk to people or people ask me questions about Legionella. So folks, mark your calendars for August 4th, where we're going to have our first episode for this year's Legionella Awareness Month. Something else we did a few weeks back I thought was a huge success. Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the CWT practice exam promotion that we did to celebrate the 4th of July. And let me tell you, so many people signed up for this course, and that makes me so happy because I know that they now have newfound confidence to sign up for the Certified Water Technologist Examination. Several of you that I am speaking with right now did that very thing. A couple of you are on the fence about it, and that's okay. You can actually look at a totally free version of the CWT prep course by going to scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep and check out the first few chapters of what we are doing in the prep course. And what we do do in that free course is we let you know what to expect with the certified water technologist process. That whole process on how do you take the exam, how do you know you're ready to take the exam, all of that stuff is in the first few chapters and you get 100% free access to that so you know what to do in order to get things started. Now, on the paid course, what we've done is we have created 100 practice questions that we think are a sampling of what you're most likely to get on the Certified Water Technologist exam. Now, here's the fact. We don't know what you're going to get because those are randomly selected, each and every participant at their terminal. But we think knowing all the things that you need to know to be a Certified Water Technologist, that these are a sampling of the questions. So we'll take you through a 100 of those you will take that practice exam and then you will watch me explain each one of the 100 questions explaining why I selected one answer over another and then also giving you more resources so you can learn more about particular topics that you might need more information on. All of that is yours for the taking. That is scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep. 
Nation, one of the things that people thank myself and my team for is keeping everybody in the know about what is going on in our water treatment world. And there are so many conferences and different exhibits that you can attend. How do you keep track of that? Well, you don't have to. You just have to be a listener of the Scaling Up H2O podcast. Or you can simply navigate over to our show page, which is scalinguph2o.com, and click on events, and you will have everything at your fingertips for you to read up on and even register. So here are a few things that you might want to put on your calendar. November 12th through 16th in San Antonio, the International Water Conference is having their conference. And here's the cool thing about the IWC. They have selected yours truly. That's right. Trace Blackmore is going to be the keynote speaker at the International Water Conference right there in San Antonio in the Marriott River Center. I have the honor of being the keynote speaker. I'm so excited about that. Can't wait to tell you about that entire experience right here on the podcast. But even better, you can be in the audience. And I sure hope that I see you there. So be sure to mark your calendars for that. Something else you might want to mark your calendars for is August 6th through 9th, also in San Antonio. The American Society for Healthcare Engineering is having their annual conference. We'll have all of that and more information on our events page. And if you ever want to look into what is going on, it is so easy. As I mentioned before, go to scalinguph2o.com, navigate over to our events page, and everything that you can think of will be listed when it comes to deal with our type of water treatment. Now, if there's something that is not on there that you know about, well, let us know that and we will get it up there. My staff does such an amazing job of keeping you in the know, and we're constantly looking for what we should add to our events page. Well, as you know, I am the proud leader of the Rising Tide Mastermind, and I'm so amazed. We have seven groups now with over 70 members. And I know we're talking about the Rising Tide Mastermind quite a bit on this podcast. It is just amazing to see what these individuals have done within the Mastermind. And all of those individuals have made the Mastermind so much more than what I initially thought it could be. With all of that said, I am a strong advocate of people getting involved in a mastermind. Now, it would be great if you get involved in the Rising Tide Mastermind, but let's face it, there are a ton of masterminds out there, and I am a member of another mastermind called Iron Sharpens Iron. And the leader of that group has actually been on this podcast twice. His name is Aaron Walker. He's been a guest on episode 184, and then he came back on episode 248. And it was during these mastermind calls that I was introduced to our next guest. And the whole topic was around why is it so difficult to find people to work for our companies? Well, that's what our interview is about today, and I know you're going to love it. Here's the interview. My lab partner today is Ron Hetrick of Lightcast, author of The Demographic Drought. Welcome, Ron. Thank you for having me, Trace. Absolutely. I want to tell you that I am in a couple of business groups, and one of my business groups, one of the partners in there, they recommended that we watch your YouTube video, The Demographic Drought, when we were talking about what the heck is going on with the job market right now. So we all watched it independently, and I have to tell you, the conversation that we were able to have after that was amazing. Not sure we ever solved anything, but we had a great conversation around it, and I have recommended that to so many people. So thank you for coming on the show. I would love to introduce your concept to the Scaling Up Nation. Sure. So demographic drought. A number of years ago, even going back to 2015, I started taking notes. I was really kind of watching the fact that it just seemed that we weren't seeing the amount of people that uh, we once saw applying for jobs. 
And I started thinking about well, what effect could aging, an aging population have on the labor force? So a lot of people talk of demographics and they like to talk about baby boomers aging and what that's going to do to maybe social security or what it's going to do for other things. But I really started thinking about the fact that this is really could have a profound effect on the labor force. At the time, really hadn't thought through just how big that was going to be. I think we knew there was going to be something. But really, the essence of demographic drought, or what we call a sans-demic, meaning without people, is that when you look at this large population going through, this baby boomer population, there was a ton of them. That meant they had to work really, really hard. I mean, these were the yuppies of the 80s, you know, working 80-hour work weeks. Uh, they had a certain mentality about work. I mean, they devoted to it sometimes to the expense of their families because of the fact that there were just so many. So you have that group highly motivated, highly skilled, and now they're all retiring. And the groups behind them are not as plentiful or as motivated through really no fault of their own, but just really kind of looking at the demographics. So demographic drought is a kind of a, a, a look inside of what this is going to do to the labor force for the next 10 to 15 years and what it's going to do to education as well. So with that, was COVID the catalyst that sped it up? This was always going to happen? We just saw it all of a sudden when the pandemic hit? Yeah, it's pretty much it. It's funny if you kind of look at the trend lines, they were kind of rolling along. We were definitely seeing this. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You could watch this thing starting to happen in 09 as the first boomers were hitting that early retirement age. And then it was really starting to play out. And then if you get to the what happened during COVID, you get this kind of, we smashed an accelerator pedal down to the ground. Then we kind of eased up on it. But the, the damage that was done by smashing that thing down, you know, not only is it not undone, I don't think it can ever be undone. And I think that's what's affecting, you know, Fed policy right now. You know, you hear it mentioned all the time, you know, even at a presidential level of, hey, getting the labor force participation rate back up again may not ever be realistic because what's accounting for the drop of people who are no, no longer participating in the labor force really is the population over 55. And they were staying in the workforce longer because they could, and then COVID hit and they were like, I don't need to do this. You know, it's funny. What you find out is, you know, when we looked at, or when I think it was the St. Louis Fed that studied it, if you look at the population that kind of went away, you know, kind of left the labor force, these were people who were over 65 who were just kind of like, hey, you know, I mean, I enjoy work. I'm going to, I'll work a couple more years. And then COVID happened. And for any number of reasons, these people were like, you know what, I'm out of here. And so a lot of people were under this impression, and this was a wrong impression, that these were early retirements. They really weren't early retirements. The 55 group, you did see a burst there, but they kind of came back. It really was that over 65 population that were like, you know what, I have the money. I was working because I liked it, but this isn't fun anymore. So I'm going to you know, go ahead and take my earnings and retire. Ron, what doesn't make sense to me is we do a lot of work with colleges to try to promote people into our firm, and we're just not getting people. And we know people are there. We know people are graduating. What's going on there? Yeah, you know, it's just, this is really interesting because you, you mentioned college, but there's two dynamics. It's almost like two populations right now. You know, for years, we talked about a STEM labor shortage, the war for talent. I mean, that's all we ever talked about for like a decade and a half. You know, we just don't have enough IT people. There's not enough engineering. And of course, we're getting these people from a lot of other countries through H-1B programs. Now, this is kind of more systemic where you're starting to hear from everybody. You know, I, I can't get some you know, skilled trades really decimated. I can't even get someone who only has a high school diploma just to come in and, and take these jobs, or at least someone of, of a quality that, uh, that seems to be committed to what we're trying to do here. You know, we just can't retain these people. And I think when it comes down to it, you know, right now, you're looking at a country that is weakening right now, just a little bit in the economy, and still has almost 10 million job openings. Now, prior to the pandemic, you know, we had 7 million job openings, and that was pretty preposterous at that time. So you, now you've added a couple more million on top of it. And I think what you're finding out is that, first off, there are a lot of options through different professions. So a, a person coming out of college has a lot of different career options. And then, I, you know, there's a second component of there are options for younger people that there weren't, you know, for us. So whether you, that's an internet influencer or investing in Bitcoin and doing Bitcoin training, like there's just a lot of things that are allowing them to not have to engage immediately or in a way that we're historically used to watching people engage with work, especially straight out of school. 
Where does birth rate fall into all of this? Yeah, so birth rate is an astounding thing to be watching across the globe in developed nations. You know, we come out of the of World War II, all the developed nations are, you know, we really did a good job of repopulating ourselves. And then in the early 1970s, we see the birth rate go below 2.1. Uh, and, and if you look back at that time, it is at the exact same time that you start seeing women in earnest entering the labor force. This is what we talk about in demographic drought. You know, we sometimes when I'm speaking, I say you know, it's, it's hard to serve you know, two masters. You, you can't say I'm going to devote everything to my career and uh, I'm also going to devote everything to to you know, raising children, women, a lot of women have to make a choice between the two. And not to say there's a ton of women who are doing both. What I'm saying is it's hard as a population in general to, to say, I want you here, but I also kind of want you doing this. So around the world, Japan, of course, this is to the nth degree. Uh, their birth rate is incredibly low. But you see this, you know, you need a 2.1 birth rate, meaning replace the parents. And then the point one is, is kind of the unfortunate thing of, People pass away. Sometimes they don't make it to adulthood. You know, so that point one is to cover that that loss so that you can replace the parents. Now we have not been at a two point one in the U.S. since the early nineteen seventies, and in recent years we hit. I think we got as low as one point six, one point seven, and we've been hovering around that area one point seven, one point eight uh, lately. But this is persistent. So if you think of birth rates, that is a compounding problem, right? So if you have so boomers, okay, they have less children, but that's going to be down a level. So then you have, so Generation X comes in, there's less Generation X. And then the millennials, which were the children of the boomers, there's not as many of them. That's called an echo boom. And then the X children come next. That's Gen Z for the most part. That's in because there weren't as many X. So the millennials are already not at that level. So the next group after that, the Zs, will be lower again. And it just keeps going in and in and in. Less people having less children causes this whole thing to kind of go in until eventually it inverts. So what do we do? I, 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 <laughs> I don't even know where, where to begin with this. So Yeah, oh, there's a thousand directions, but I'll just say this. It's a lot easier in a podcast format than when I, I speak from a stage because this is kind of a, a tricky subject. But in the end of the day, you know, what you can't do is you can't go back and you can't have children. So, you know, one of the things that I talk about is we have a service economy, but there's no one here to serve us. So, you know, what this ultimately means is if you don't have the people here, then really what you're doing is going out and getting other people. Now, historically speaking, you know, we are a land of immigration. We kind of grew ourselves through that, but it really does mean that the future, and I'm not saying anything here that every demographer and every you know, estimator of population hasn't already said, but our growth in the future will only come through immigration, will not come any more domestically. We just don't have that population that did not replenish itself. So a lot of the things you're watching play out right now, politically speaking, have very serious implications because this was our only path forward. And now it's just a matter of how do we do it right. And I think that's what we all struggle to figure out. Something you just alluded to is, uh, you know, we, we make a lot of things here in this country. We don't have a lot of people that are able to fix those things. We have people that are, are leaving trades. We're not replenishing that. That's going to create a tremendous problem. I don't know where I'm going with how I'm going to form a question around this, but, uh, but what do you think about all of this? Yeah. So last year I wrote, I co-wrote uh, Who's Going to Do the Work? So in that paper, we interviewed 1,500 high school students about their intentions after school. Now, this was co-written with a company called Tal, which works with students, you know, basically going into college. So our sample would be biased because these are people who are probably going to go. But we did have 85% of our respondents who said, I'm going to get a four-year degree, if not right away, eventually. You can look at a study that came out a couple of years ago and it's more like 55, 60%. And people looked at that study and were like, wow, this is the dire state of the US. Like only 55% of you know, people graduating high school you know, plan on going to college. The actual number is around 63%. That's what we use, that's what we're seeing right now. Now, the point in who's going to do the work is if two-thirds of all graduating high school seniors and tend to go to a four-year college or are going to a four-year college, but 60 to 70% of the jobs in the U.S. don't require or need a four-year degree, things like skilled trades, retail, restaurants, manufacturing, construction, that can go on and on and on. Those are the jobs that kind of keep your economy 
functional so that you actually can, you know, my trash collection came today. We need those people. If you don't think you need those people, go a week or two without having your trash picked up. Uh, the industry that you all work in, try going a week or two without water. <laughs> try going a week or two with all these things. And you start to look at it and you go, oh my goodness, I didn't think about that. Like there's so many mouths to feed just to make the economy function. And we can't do that if everybody's going to college. So it's more, it's bigger than skilled trades, but skilled trades in my mind is that kind of bullseye. We're really going to be in trouble if we can't figure that part out. Because I do laugh a lot at this concept of, well, it's okay. Robots are going to replace people. That's hilarious. Um, who's going to build them? Who's going to install them? Who's going to fix them? Because we don't have any of those people now. So where are those people going to come from that are doing all of this robot installation that, you, that you're talking about? And I think this is where we're really, we have a, just a very poor understanding of who we are as a nation, uh, how we've progressed and changed. You know, if we, in the article, I think it was the second article we wrote, we had three times as many lower skilled unemployed people for each job opening in 2015 than we have now. Three times as many lower skilled unemployed people looking for a job for each job than we have now. So we are changing very, very rapidly into a very hyper-educated economy. Unfortunately, you need all of these things represented or you end up not functioning. And that's, you know, that's certainly the warning that we were trying to give people. I'm a big fan of Mike Rowe. He does a podcast. He's the host of Dirty Jobs, one of my favorite shows. And he has a, a group called Micro Works, and it's all about educating people that we need skilled tradespeople. And I remember uh, uh, an article he put out where it showed how much you could make as a skilled tradesperson on day one versus paying back college loans. And if you looked over the life of that, it was tremendous. Uh, I don't know if that's made an impact, but I think we need more of that to allow people to know that, you know, you don't have to go to college. There are other options for that. Or if you do go to college, there's still other options for it. Correct. And who's going to do the work? That's something we really try to, to point out. And that paper has done incredibly well in the skilled trades world. But the, what, we're, what we were saying in that was stop telling everybody to do the same outcome. You know, we have guidance counselors in high school. And the, where my kids went to school here in Florida was just, I mean, it was insane. The pressure on a middle school kid. Have you taken this number of classes? Well, you're not positioned. Everybody. Oh, you, you're not positioned. You're going to have to get, if you want to get into this college. And I'm like, that was the wrong message. We've got to stop telling everybody to go for the same outcome or we're all going to die under that outcome. Like who's going to, how are we going to eat? You know, who's going to produce food? Who's going to distribute food? All of these things, they seem so basic, but no one's really thought about it because there was always this belief, well, we have an endless supply of lower skilled people. But that is an absolute lie. You know, if we look at the current labor force of the U.S., you have 155 million people on payrolls, 160 million people working in jobs. 100 million of those people have at least an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. And the largest population in our labor force by far are people with a bachelor's degree. The smallest are these people who only have a high school diploma or less. And so when you look at the job openings that are out there, you have about five to six million job openings right now in our country right now that only need a high school diploma or less. But we only have about two million of those people. Now think about it. These ca jobs can't be done remote. They have to be at the location. So it's more than just saying you have a lot less of this population. With the, the, the four-year degree people, if you really get desperate, you could probably figure out a way of doing that job remote. But you can't have a remote fire person or a remote, you know, utilities person who needs to go put up a line like those people have to be there. So it makes this all that more acute. So to circle back on your point in the deck that I have right now, we talk about an electrician. OK, I'm 18 years old. I get out of high school and I'm an apprentice electrician. After by the time after a couple of years, I've gotten along by the time I'm 25, I can be a master level electrician. And our current the numbers in our in Lycast are saying about eighty three thousand a year is what they make. Okay, master electrician is making about eighty three thousand a year. Now, let's say I'm an accountant, and it took me four to five years to get out of school. I'm now twenty two. I hit twenty five. I'm still a staff accountant. I'm making about sixty thousand a year if I'm lucky. Just depends on where I'm at. 
If I've added another level skill to that, I'm making more. I can make up 70, 75. You're chasing this person, but that person never accumulated any debt, to Mike Rose's point. Not only that, but if you think about what Zs say they want, which is, I want to contribute. I want to do something valuable. Uh, I want a work-life balance. Well, the master electrician's probably running their own shop by the time they're 30, determining their own hours, doing everything basically as they want versus the accountant, for example, who's now in a company and is, you know, you got to be in the office now. You got to do this. And, and we expect this from you and that from you. There's no ownership about your life. This is the message that we're not getting out. I'm not demeaning accounts in any way, shape or form. What I'm saying is what's, what's an incredible thing is that we've somehow managed to stratify jobs as some jobs being good and others being somehow bad or lower class. It's like, that is completely wrong thinking. They are all critical to making things work. And so we need parents, we need educators, we need everybody's putting that same message out there of all of these jobs add value. We need people in every one of them. Please, what can I do to guide you down a path to get to those jobs? One of the other issues are people are opting out of the workforce. Is there a way to get them to opt back in? And everybody's curious, how can you opt out of work? How How do I sign up for that? Yeah, so an interesting thing around that. So recently, the prime age labor force participation rate did recover back to kind of where it was prior to the pandemic. But you got to understand, we were on a 20-year slide. Now, that slide was mostly coming from men, and we're still seeing problems in that regard. Now, some of these people who are opting out, you know, one of the things we talk about in that paper is you are dealing with a pretty extensive, you know, fentanyl opioid problem. So not only do you have people who are who have died of you know as a result of addiction, but you have people battling addiction, and so you have all you know millions of, of men who are doing that, who are battling these things. And if it's not addiction, it's depression. If it's not you know depression, it's other kinds of these things. And so they just kind of drop out. You know, as we say in the paper, and for anybody who hasn't seen the video or, or seen the paper, you know, there were more men 25 to 34 years old in the last census who lived with their parents than with a spouse for the first time since the Civil War. Okay, so you do see a lot of what we call failure to launch, but a lot of uh, men staying at home a lot longer and just not being encouraged or pushed a little farther. What we typically hear is, well, I'm in between things. And I I hear that every time I'm speaking. I'm in between things. I'm like, there's a lot of men who are in between things. Um, I think that what happens is in, in any individual circumstance, somebody would be able to defend, well, this is our situation. We can't do that. But you have to understand as a collective, as a population, it creates a systemic issue. Uh, and I think that that's what's going to be really hard because what is really astounding is the uh, currently the Bureau of Labor Statistics is projecting that the labor force participation rate will continue to go down till 2030. It's going to continue going down. Why is three factors. One, the boomers retiring. That's that. That was those were the ones who are really wanted to work. Two, you're about to experience as we talk about in the paper, an extraordinary transfer of wealth. You know, estimates have been all over. We use 1.6 trillion from boomers passing money on to their, you know, millennial children, which will make millennials the richest generation in history, just from passed on wealth. Along with that passed on wealth is a third factor, and that is elder care. You know, we've spent the past 15 years, 20 years talking about child care, but a dynamic that's going to take place over the next 10 years, especially because the hospitals will not be able to staff up even remotely close to what they're going to need. Um, I've, I've spoken more to the healthcare industry in the past two years than I've spoken to anybody. And they realize that, you know, nursing homes, we may not be able to staff nursing homes much longer. You know, it's going to be about assistance. It's going to be about home care. You know, people are going to have to be doing that. And maybe this transference of wealth, the expectation of home care, this is going to knock a lot more people out of the labor force because they'll have the money of, to live on but they also have a responsibility that puts them in situations where they won't be able to work. And I think a lot of people haven't really thought about that part either. So this podcast serves the industrial water treatment industry. Everybody is listening, trying to figure out, one, how do I retain who I have? And how do I find new talent so we can do these critical services that we do? What advice do you have for us? Yeah, and who's going to do the work? One thing that had really jumped out at me as we were writing that paper, it's something I've been thinking about just in general, but as we were writing the paper, and then as I started speaking on it, uh, really, really hit me. And we do talk about that a lot on who's going to do the work. And that is 
industries that are not universities or are not like the Googles of the world have an enormous marketing problem. You know, they have let society market on their behalf. And that marketing has been very horrible. Uh, you know, like they have not only do they have a great brand, but they have brochures of, you know, we always joke about, you know, let's say that you're trying to employ people straight out of high school or in like skilled trades. Well, you're competing against college and universities who are, have massive marketing departments who, you know, put out these flyers of, you know, multiracial people sitting on the college green throwing the football back and forth. And it's like you're competing against a machine that has a lot more, you know, invested in producing a narrative that is really attractive to young people. So if you're a young person and you see this, you see yourself in the, and who's going to do the work? One of the questions we asked, which was, we had an unbelievable answer to was, do you see college to be as much about the experience of going to college as getting the degree? And the overwhelming, I think it was two thirds of our respondents were like, yes. Like it's as much about being there with your peers coming of age together as much as that, as it is getting a degree. And I thought, oh, good Lord, skilled trades is really going to be fighting a really hard battle because how do you create a situation where you can put people in that kind of environment where they feel like, well, if I go this route, I'm immediately going to be kind of like on my own. I'm just going to be surrounded by a bunch of old people and all this other stuff. That's a marketing problem. Once again, it's a coordination problem. So I think number one, in the industry that you're in, one of the things you have to do is go to your websites, go to your messaging. Would you want to have worked there when you were coming out of school? Thinking about the options that people have, what about it is exciting? You do a critical function. Gen, Gen Z say over and over again, I want to do something of value. You're doing something of value. So why aren't they flocking to your doors and begging to come in? It's because the messaging that they've received to this point is like, oh, well, not that. Why not? Let me bring you in. Let me show you what this is like. So I think there's a the marketing problem, the messaging, I think making sure that these people get networked. And then I would say a big thing as well is I, I believe you've got to get these people into your environment when they're younger. So I think a lot of people go, well, we go to the schools and we speak. I'm like, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about get them into your environment, get them under a mentor, you know, have them doing an easier part of the job under a mentor who's investing in them so that they can look at this and go, you know what? I think I could, I think I want to make a career out of this. Like these people are pretty, they're pretty awesome and they care about me. And it looks like they want to see me grow. I'll do that. You know, I think that that's a, that's a pretty big component as well. You know, that's very interesting. If you go to a company's website, would you really want to work there? And I think if people start looking at that in that light, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe there is some more interest. And I never really thought about the college marketing department and how they are selling fun as well as, you know, come to our college to get the degree. We need to start thinking like that. It's incredible. You know, the first point that I was making, I'd love to take credit for that, but I watched a genius at work one time. I was at a meeting with a guy and this was when I was still in the staffing industry. And we came to talk to this company and they were a large, like they made like large tractors and everything. We're sitting down with them and we're talking about, you know, their problem attracting talent and everything. And this guy's specialty was going in and looking at websites. And what he was doing was he would go in and see, first off, could I even find your career page? Could I even get a gauge for what these things were versus you just throwing job postings up there? Like, was there any connection to the cool things that you were doing? And then he would really look at the imagery of, you know, is this a thing that if I clicked on it, I, my eyes would be like, oh my, this is really cool. And what he said to these guys, I just never forgot was you're doing something really neat here. You know, all you have to do is go walk around this building where you have these tractors and it's phenomenal. That message is gone from you. Like there's none of that on your website. Like if I went there looking for a job, first off, it's not easy to even find them. It's just text. Like you just threw them up there and there's just no passionate image that I'm attaching myself to. And I really do challenge people to, to think about that as, you know, if you're trying to attract labor, are you putting forth the really the coolest parts of what you do? I tell people like, if you're an HVAC, you know, it's that person who's just helped a young mother, your air, air conditioner died and you went and fixed that. It's like, that's an image that's such a great thing for society. That's the kind of stuff that you want to stick out there, the service that you're doing, the value that you bring. Great points. 
I'm curious, are is it just the United States that's suffering the demographic drought? Oh, no. So fact, it's a global. It, it's almost we, – we are actually – when you compare us with other countries, we are actually in a better spot than most. So it's interesting to watch us. So I'll, I'll shoot through some really quickly. So China's inversion started last year. They experienced their first population loss. Uh, Russia's been losing about a million a year. This is before uh, the invasion of Ukraine. They were already going to lose about a million a year over the next 10 years. Uh, There's articles everywhere. You can look them up right now uh, about the flight of all those Russian men away is just going to take this birth rate, you know, much, much lower. And it's already a crisis. Germany is, is already in a lot of trouble. Italy is in enormous trouble. Birth rates have been extremely low. I talked to somebody there who said, we can't get internet in our part of the country because there's no one to work in the industry that would put internet in your house. So you can't get it because there's just no one here to do those jobs. Uh, Japan is notorious. I think we've been watching this now for two decades. Their economy will shrink somewhere between 25 to 50% over the next 25 years because their population is just going. Last year, I think, I don't know the number exactly, it was like Japan had, I think, 200 or 300,000 births. And that number, that low number came eight years before their projections. So their population decline model is tremendously off. And it's actually going to, it's actually happening way faster than they thought it was going to. And that's what we're seeing around the world right now. So, you know, the good news that we can talk about this as we continue this conversation is that there are countries that are ahead of us, but they're not necessarily producing success stories just yet. In Japan's case, the people, people are working till they're 85 years old and their women can't have children because they're so needed in the labor force because the labor force is so, you know, tapped out that like, how do you fix a problem? It's a compounding problem. What's the most common question you get asked when you speak? What can we do everywhere I go? So I get it. You know, it's funny is <laughs> I literally get asked to speak. It's almost nonstop. Uh, I went to a Kentucky Derby party on Saturday at a party of neighbors and came away with two people asking me to speak to their companies. I'm like, you don't understand. Like, it's just, (laughs) I'm not a, it's not really solutions that I offer. It's a full explanation of what the problem looks like. Now, what's funny about that is we've, we've often compared this to like going to a cancer doctor. So you're, you're feeling pain, you're hearing these things and you get the news and the news is definitely not something you wanted to hear, but at least you have a sense of peace of going, okay, now what are my treatment options? Because this is, this sounds like it's going to be here. This is, this is a condition. What am I going to do it? And that's kind of how we equate it. And so I think I've worked really hard over the past year or so to try to incorporate more, you know, what can you do? But really I, the one takeaway that we, you know, we put this in at the end of demographic drought. I've also learned more to kind of emphasize this. And that is the level of service that you've been getting for the past 20, 30 years because of that glut of people in the labor force, that's going away. Uh, we experienced it a lot, right? During the past year or so, there was a labor shortage. You go into a restaurant, the whole restaurant's not open. You go to get your car done and they're like, we can get it to you in like three days, but we just don't, I mean, we have a huge amount of cars. We just don't have a lot of, you know, our, our workforce is down. That is the future. Now, some people would look at that and go, that is incredibly depressing. And I would say that was life before the boomers. So go back into the 1950s, 40s, 60s. That was what life was like. We didn't have 900 fast food restaurants in your hometown. The town I grew up in, Newark, Ohio, had two. You know, And I think there will be less of those. You'll have less options. You'll cook at home more. And some people, would, once again, would just look at that and be like, this is so horrible. And I'm like, it just is different. You're, you are so accustomed to a standard, let it go. And we say this at demographic drought, just be really happy for the people who are working there. Please treat people better. Don't yell at anybody if your service was slow. Tell them you understand. I've gotten a lot of free things that way, just saying. <laughs> um, you know, just that level of going, I know what's going on and I get it. Don't worry about it. We, we'll take our time here. Change your attitude and change your uh, expectations. Ron, if somebody wanted to find out more about you and your work, what should they do? So go to lightcast.io. That's the company uh, that I work for. And, you know, I'm not the only person they're doing research. There's a lot of incredible things coming out there. 
But you'll find demographic drought there. You'll see the second article, which was called Bridging the Gap, and then who's going to do the work. The first two presentations that I gave on demographic drought and then the follow-up are on YouTube. You could watch those if you haven't already. Uh, what I highly suggest to people, and this doesn't do me any good, so I'm not like making money off of that, but follow me on LinkedIn. If you see what I put up, it's all over the place. Like It's whatever interests me at that particular time. So if it's the housing market or if some headline that I saw that was just completely inaccurate, I like to do a lot of correction of clickbait headlines and thoughts about AI and what it can do for industries. You know, It's not the same as what everybody else is saying. I, I tend to take an angle from what does this mean for labor? Like, Is this going to help us at the end of the day? AI right now, it's the rage. It's going to erase all of these jobs. History tells us that's absolutely not true. And the reason why is when you look into the future, you look at a job that could be done by AI. What you never consider is what new industries will AI create that you didn't even know could exist right now in 2023. But three years from now, you're going to be like, wow, this came out of nowhere. And that industry is employing marketing and sales and distribu distributors and a global network of people. This is what we always miss is these things, these innovations we come up with, the robots that I talked about early, you know, there's going to be a robot army. Well, that's fascinating. Who's installing this robot army? You know, who's, who's going to take care of this army? It's like in um, the current presentation I do, there's a quote from the CEO of McDonald's. He said this in July of last year. And he, he said, look, it's great at garnering headlines, but it's not coming. It is, he goes, it's cost way too much to convert you know, what our place to like an AI or a robotic built thing. That was a really telling statement because fast food, I've met with some fast food behemoths, met with their corporate leadership. And the thing that I told them was develop a less worker intensive model. So one of those companies now has started doing drive through only models. You know, you don't, you're not a restaurant, you're a fast food. So why have people employed cleaning and doing all these things on the inside of the place just devote it to getting people food fast. And I think that this is kind of what we're kind of looking at going forward is taking these ideas and saying, how can we change the delivery model, which we, we use? Yeah, we've definitely started seeing that in the Atlanta area where we see kiosks going up instead of waiting in line and somebody taking your order. Yeah. And I think where we're still missing there, and this has always just cracked me up right now, we, we talk about this in demographic drought. The biggest consumers of robotics right now are the industries that have always been consuming robotics. It's still semiconductors. It's still auto manufacturing or electrical uh, components manufacturing. Now, if that robot breaks, you send everybody home. The tech comes over, fixes it. Hey, we'll pick up production tomorrow. Off we go. All right, cool. I have a robot that I have doing surgery on somebody. I have a robot that I have cooking all of my burgers in a fast food place, that machine breaks. My revenue is gone or I'm risking someone's life. When you start to put this in other environments, the ability to handle the negative aspect of automation, that tolerance goes really down because the second this machine isn't cooking the food right or doing, you know, doing something wrong, a tech's going to have to fix it. Well, we don't have techs. Let's say you have one tech covering a region of 30 restaurants and eight machines break. Some of those restaurants, they may be down for a week. That's a ton of lost revenue. So what you would prefer, what you would do is say, well, let's just say, let's just do what the robotics companies already tell us they want you to do, which is have a person, the robot's there to make your job easier. It's not there to replace you. That Every robotics company out there says that because they mean it. It's too risky to let these things do these things on their own you need somebody there as a fail safe. That's why in every manufacturing plant, we've invented machines to do the work of certain parts of a production line. But there's a person standing right there on every part of that production line watching that. And the section, the, the, the moment that that machine starts doing something wrong, somebody jumps in to correct it or shut that machine down, you know, throw the fail safe and take this thing offline. You know, that's kind of how we're looking at this is look towards robotics as a way of making jobs less awful <laughs> and less as a means of the robot armies coming to take your job and you'll be less threatened by it. And then it'll also encourage you to think more open-minded about the ways we could use them. 
Ron, is there a book in the future? So I have decided not to go down that route. I, I am an incredibly ADD. Uh, I think the paper was a cathartic experience. I remember sitting at the front end of that going, what, you know, what would a book require? And then uh, we had some other brilliant writers in the company, uh, this is Hannah and uh, Gwen, and they were, they were like, hey, we have these other writers. And just the thought of going, oh, wow, that would be so great to just like share ideas and have other people write uh, turned out to be really great. So what I've realized is I'm probably I'm, I'm actually pretty good at short form. You know, it's not a blog. It's bigger than a blog. Demographic droughts, I think, 55 pages. But it's just the idea of saying, let's just make sure that you really understand this point. So many times with books, they say a point and then just say it over and over and over again. I think what we were trying to do is say, we'll show you the full breadth. If you want it again, start at the beginning and read it again. And I've had people told me, I've read it five times. And I'm like, that's cool. That's what I want. You know, that's what I would want you to do. So yeah, look, there will be more writing. There's things deep down in the recesses of my mind. I just haven't figured out what I want to do yet. It's a fantastic paper. I have shared it with so many people. It has allowed me to at least get an understanding of what's going on. And through that understanding, you're now empowered to do something differently. So I really want to thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing that with all of us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Ron, thanks again for coming on Scaling Up H2O. And don't worry, we will have links to everything that we talked about during the interview. I promise you are going to want to go on YouTube and check out Ron's video of the demographic drought. He's got all sorts of evidence and graphs proving his point, and it is well worth the watch. In fact, you're probably going to want to share that with other people within your company. And we'll have all of that information on our show notes page. So keep your hands on 10 and 2. We will make it safe for you to find Find the information when you are ready to find it. Now, as Ron said, his job was to identify the problem. It's really up to us to figure out what we're going to do about the problem. One of the things I think that we should double down on is employee engagement. How well are our employees engaging in our company and are we giving them opportunities to do that? Now, there are several tools out there that help us determine employee engagement in our companies. The one that I am the most familiar with is Gallup's Q12 poll. Now, like I said, there's many more, so there might be another one that you're familiar with. The goal is, how do you track how engaged your team is? And do you know if you're doing well or poorly in a particular area? Now more than ever, we need to correct any issues that we have with employee engagement because it's very likely we're not going to be able to replace anybody that leaves very easily. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Q12 because that's the one that I know. So if you know another one, by all means, you can fast forward through this part. But this is a really good tool that was introduced to me several years ago, and we've been using it here for quite some time. It goes through four individual questions. It actually goes through 12 questions, but there's four categories it works through. The first one is basic needs. Are your employees' basic needs being met? There's two questions with that. There's four questions that deal with the individual actually contributing to the company. Then there's four other questions that deal with how they are part of the team. And the final two questions deal with, is the employee feeling like they have an opportunity for growth? There is a whole concept around how to ask these questions, how to decipher the information, and that's probably a show on its own. Maybe I'll put that in a future show ideas list all around Q12 because it really is a good tool. But what I want to leave you with here today is when was the last time that you've done that? 
you know, I know all the employers out there care about their team members, but how are you getting feedback to make sure what you're doing is connecting with each and every person? And if people don't know what's expected of them and they don't understand how they are being rated on those expectations, where they fall within those expectations, and then finally, their opportunities for growth, that's gonna create confusion. And when people are confused, they look for reasons to find ways to be unconfused, and that might be easier for them to look for another job. So the whole point here is we want to make sure that we keep right employees right where they are because they know how they fit in the company. You know what you need to work on to get them to fit even better in the company. And it is so much better to elevate people that you currently have than to find people that you are looking for. Because if you've tried that recently, they are very difficult to find. So with all of that, I hope this show today has helped you look at why we have this issue with an employee shortage. But more importantly, what can you do about it? And how do you make sure that you create the best team you possibly can? You know, figuring out how we do better is one of the things that we do here on this show. And whether we're talking about how do we make our team better or how do we make ourselves better one week at a time, of course, we refer to our friend James McDonald. Here is the next installment of Periodic Water Table with James. Hello and welcome to the Periodic Water Table with James, where we think and learn about water chemistry drop by drop. Please use your week to search online, ask your colleagues, or even pick up a book to learn more about each week's periodic water table topic. If you do, at the end of the year, you'll be 52 water chemistry smarter. So let's raise the water table of knowledge together and get started. Today's topic is... Total Dissolved Solids. Now Trace recently did a Pinks and Blues episode on Total Dissolved Solids and Connectivity. Let's see how much you remember. How do you define total dissolved solids or TDS? Are suspended solids included in this definition? What are examples of chemicals included? Are TDS and conductivity the same or different? How are they related? Is there one rule of thumb to convert from one to the other or can the conversion differ for different waters? How is TDS measured? How is this different from how suspended solids are measured? How does cycling up affect TDS in a water system? What might be the impact on TDS if a water system is overcycled or chemical feed is interrupted? Remember, knowledge is power, and taking the time to learn more about water chemistry each week will help make you a force to be reckoned with. Be sure to post what you learned to social media and tag it with hashtag watertable23 and hashtag scalinguph2o. I look forward to learning more from you. Thank you, James. Nation, once again, my call to action is for you to take this knowledge and do something with it. Maybe think a little bit differently. Maybe meet somebody new. Maybe educate a customer about how you can help them. Nation, it is always my pleasure to bring you this podcast each and every week, and I'll have a brand new one for you next week on Scaling Up H2O. Scaling Up Nation, have you signed up to take your Certified Water Technologist designation exam? If you have, you've received a mock exam copy, and I have answered each one of the questions in that mock exam, letting you know which ones are the best answers. I share tips and tricks about the exam, making sure that you sign up easily and confidently. And when you go in to take the examination, you have got certain things working for you because you're prepared. To find out more, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep. Once again, that's scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep.